we are recording over here as well. And this is just blah, blah, blah to sync it up. And three, two, one. Sometimes if I close my eyes really tight and I think really hard, I can see little lights and they look like stars. You know who you are, who you were before this. I will not fall back into darkness. If you weren't special, you wouldn't have been chosen. This is where we start to take control. Imagine having to start all over again. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Tightrope's series of postmortems on web series. This particular episode will be featuring Sell the Web Series, as presented by Mr. Mark Gardner, the writer, director, and producer of the series. The purpose of our postmortems is for a web series to be able to present a season or their series of the show, which is just a mini series, and really tear it apart, really look into what worked and what didn't work when it comes to. All production aspects, um, all the kind of behind-the-scenes stuff that affects us as web series creators. Also, we have three evaluators with us this evening, those being Mr. Matt Newcomb, writer, director, and producer of Hollywood Wasteland. Hello, Mr. everyone. Mr. Rob Paget, writer, director, and producer of Vampire Zombie Werewolf. Howdy. And web series producer, Miss Allison Venor. Hello. How are you? Hello there. Not too bad. <laughs> I am James Fernandez, but you don't care about that. This evening's show will be Sell the Web Series. What we're going to have first is our presenter, Mr. Mark Gardner, uh, will sort of give us an overview of his web series. It was released in 2010. It was 13 episodes long. And I will now give the floor to Mr. Mark Gardner, who will present Sell the Web Series. Hi. Thanks, James. Um, so, yeah, let's just do a quick uh, presentation, if you will, on Sell. Just like you said, it was released in... 2010, which blows me away that my first episode was in February of 2010. What's that? Um, a few things about the production. We shot it over two weeks in an abandoned dollar store in Smithville, Texas. That had some pluses and minuses. The pluses were it was very cheap to use that location. The minuses were everything else. <laughs> um... <laughs> Being in an old abandoned dollar store in a little town in Texas right next to a highway, there were certain times of the day we learned early on from about 2.30 to 4 o'clock we couldn't shoot because school let out and there were school buses going everywhere in town. So we had to kill those days. We also found out we lost an entire day of shooting when we realized that the electrical was not up to code anymore, and we were getting ground loop on every piece of sound equipment we had. So we had to deal with a lot of those issues. We also had an issue where a 35 millimeter adapter for our camera broke on the first day of shooting. So all of our shot lists and everything that we had planned on using the adapter for were out the window, and we had to redo those. So we shot flat the entire show. I think that we did a pretty good job opening it up, considering we were flat. but. It was an adjustment we had to make on some things. Uh, we also had some other issues scattered here and there. I think probably the biggest one that we had was about a week before we were set to shoot, we had to completely tear apart and rebuild the set because it was done incorrectly. That was fun. Um, we didn't have time to do a lot of the stuff that we wanted. We were planning on doing a lot of work with practicals, uh, doors that opened mechanically, um, functioning monitors, everything like that. A lot of that had to be changed at the last minute. So we made a lot of last minute changes like pouring concrete in the middle of a dollar store the night before we were set to shoot. So we actually had to change our shooting schedule so that the set that wasn't dry, we didn't shoot on that for the first day. We got the one that was as dry as we could. We shot on that the first day, and then we went through everything else. So there were a lot of little hurdles that we went through. Um, 
some positives that we dealt with were the fact that we did have Beth Chamberlain come in and ask to be a part of the show, which was able to let me go back and shoot the finale again. So I was able to shoot the last half of the finale again with Beth Chamberlain in a new location on a red so that we got what I feel was a better finale. So that was one positive out of everything. Um, as far as in the questionnaires for presenting the show, I'm not sure that I, I want to go out and say what I feel is the strongest, is what I feel the weakest is. I'm more interested in what everybody else thinks is the strongest and weakest part of the series, if there's a strong, if there's a weak, whatever, what it is, it, how do I fix it? Um, that's kind of the main thing. A few things that I'm really interested in is just, especially from the web perspective and being a really dark drama on the web, which I would argue this may be one of the darkest dramas on the web. Um, there are some other dark ones, but I think this one's pretty depressing. Um, <laughs> some thoughts about how the episodes hold up, where they drag, where they don't drag. The pacing is something I've learned a lot about, just self-examination. I would love to hear from you other creators specifically some things that you would do. And that's all. I'm just really excited and curious to hear what you guys have to say about things. Thank you very much, Mr. Gardner. Now we move on to the second part of our postmortem here, which is uh, going down the line with our evaluators. They're each going to present their uh, their thoughts, their inputs, their opinions, and they may also ask questions of the presenter. So first down the line, we're going to go to Mr. Matt Newcomb, writer, director, producer. And when you are ready, sir, go ahead and give us your evaluation on Cell. All right. Well, the first thing I'd like to say is uh, this was definitely uh, one of the series that I was most excited to follow when it was when it was coming out. So uh, I think what really interested me the most was the unique world that you built with it. Uh, I'm big on the world building aspect of it, and I know you put a lot of time into into that as far as you know having a Bible and having all the details, uh, you know, really well defined, which I which I really liked. Uh, you did a lot of things in there that were really surprising. Um, you know, some of the, you know, the way that uh, you dealt with some of the main characters and everything. Not no not spoilers. No spoilers. <laughs> uh, so, I, well, I appreciate that because uh, there was a lot of unexpected turns in there, which was, you know, makes for good uh, good entertainment. Uh, going back to the the darkness of it. Uh, one, I guess, uh, thing that I, I found trouble with the uh, the series, with it being on the web, was literally uh, how dark some of it was. Uh, I've I've seen it projected before, and I you know I've seen like, I guess maybe some of the footage that was more closer to the source material, and it looked and it looks amazing, but I've also seen it uh, on several web players where it got. Uh, you know, it, you get a lot of the uh, compression artifacts and things, and it it almost was hard to pick out the details sometimes too, which I thought was kind of a of an interesting side effect, I guess, of the way uh, you know that it gets put up on the web. Uh, going on, uh, I guess the other um, you know. Thing that kind of went with that was the uh, the sound. A lot of times coming out of the speakers it was a little hard to to hear because a, a lot of the scenes were were so intimate, and uh, a few times I had to strain get my ear up right up next to the speaker to hear some of it. Uh, and I think you have commented on that before, so I'll save that for uh, for later. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think that's that's my grand overview. I'd like to pass it off to someone else now and then come back later. More specifics. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Newcomb. Now we're going to move on to Mr. Rob Paget, Also writer, director, and producer. When you are ready, <laughs> sir, take it away. Uh, yeah, uh, I agree so far with what Matt said. Uh, one of my first notes was that... Ha 
that the show was very dark and kind of hard to see in a room with lights on. Um, and the compression issues, too. I was, I was wondering, and maybe... Because uh, I know Blip lets you re-upload, replace the video files. I mean, I don't know if it's a compression issue on your end or if it's something that Blip... I watched through Blip because I was on your website. <clears throat> um, I don't know if it's something they do. It, you know, who knows what that's all about. But uh, first of all, well, like a second of all, the show's really good. <laughs> um, it's funny because I've heard about it before I knew you or most people in web series. It was something that came across mm -hmm. I found or... I don't remember how I found it, but I found it before I found, but before I knew who any of you were, I knew what <laughs> Cell was. And uh, it was exciting because the story I was reading about it was how the production values were so much better than a lot of web series that were out at the time. And it's true. The production values are really good. Mm -hmm. um, I th you talked about pace earlier, and I think the pace is definitely a little slow. Um, the pace with the darkness, with the music, which is great, has a tendency to be hypnotic at times, and especially with the sound design being the way that it is. Um, I didn't have a hard time hearing it, but I have my speakers turn up really loud. Um, the reason it, the sound design felt hypnotic is because there's... Did you use lab mics? Uh, yeah, we did, actually. They were... Um... She hid them in the hair, so if you look really close, you might be able to see them in their hair sometimes. But yeah, you can't that's... see half your show, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not going to see the mic. Yes, we were loved. We wanted to use a boom, but our uh, our sound said that they would not work. So we were picking up a lot of the electrical from the location. Oh, and and I'm sure that it was probably an echo chamber in there too. Oh yeah, that she was very angry at me because we had to build concrete floors with walls, and it was a 20 by 30 space. Oh. Well, and it's, it's funny, because it, my note is that the, the sound is too, too clean. I felt like it should be put in the room a little bit more um, to make me feel like we're in a cell. It felt so warm, kind of, in your cold cell, just but when you listen to it. Um, the set's great, um, yeah. although I did pay attention half the time to the fact that her cell is built different than his. <laughs> it is? Yeah, like the, the, the strip on the bottom where the bars go in isn't the yeah. same. It's the same. There's some differences in her cell. Really? Yeah. I'm going to have to look at that. <laughs> it's in the room here. <laughs> it's just room here. It's, it's got that woman's touch. It's real nice. <laughs> um, Interesting. And then uh, I think my biggest like, criticism would be that I felt that the actors were held back a little bit in some places. Um, especially the main uh, guy whose name I can't remember. Um, Danny? Yeah. Danny. I felt he was a little constrained, and I don't know if that was him or if that was you, but uh, I felt like a lot of times him especially was fighting the impulse to get up and do something, fighting the impulse to move and do something, and I felt like he could have... If he was a little more active, that would have helped the pace at the beginning, and I would have felt really excited when... Because the, the premise is exciting, and the story is exciting, and all that stuff, but I didn't really feel like he was a caged man. I felt like he woke up in a cage and kind of resolved himself to it, sort of, in a way. He wasn't, he wasn't going to... He didn't want to break your set. <laughs> 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 Which... It was easy to break. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, I think somebody else could take it from now because I have a lot of questions and stuff, fun questions about the show. It's just uh, stuff I'm interested in. All righty. <laughs> now we will move on to the evaluation of Ms. Allison Van Orr, multiple web series producer yes. over here. When you are ready, take it away. <laughs> sure. Um, well, Mark, uh, first of all, I agree. Like, I think it's a really, really good show. Um, you know, I've also, I've, I saw episodes at, I think it was ITV Fest a couple years ago, and I really liked it, um, and so it was nice, actually, because I, I'd seen episodes here and there, and never, I never sat down in one sitting and watched all of them all the way through, so it was nice to kind of do that and get a, a feel for everything together, which usually, you know, with television and with web series, you don't do anyway, but, um, 
you know, I didn't actually have any problems with the darkness issue. I actually felt like I could see everything pretty well. The sound was an issue for me, and I was wearing, like, little headphones, and that may have been it, but I had to kind of stop and go back, especially a couple times with Jordan's lines. I, you know, I missed what she said, and I'm like, what did she say? And I had to play it over and over again just to catch, you know, the things that she was saying. So for me, that was that was something um, that was an issue. Um, you know, I think in terms of the pacing, I think you know, I, I hate myself for saying this because I love slow moving, like slow paced um, cinema. Um, and so for me, this is the type of show I would choose to watch if I was going to like, you know, watch something. Um, I would pick to watch something like this, but I feel like for the web, it's too slow um, in some areas. And I agree with Rob with um, the one actor. I, I felt like I felt like if he was doing something differently, I would I would feel better about sitting and watching some of those scenes between the two of them where, because you know, there's not a lot going on. They're not physically doing very much, so it's hard. I mean, you gave yourself a very difficult task of telling the story and keeping it interesting over, you know, however many minutes we're watching the entire show when they're in the same spot. Um, but I did feel like he made me feel like he should be doing something, like, you know, do something, because <laughs> he, he did feel constrained a little bit. Um, so that was kind of, that was my biggest thing, is just kind of that pacing and that one actor. Um, but I thought, like, overall, it was really interesting, and it kept me, it kept me wondering. I liked, I liked the writing, I liked the story, um, and I was super frustrated in the end, of the, in the, you know, finale. <laughs> um, and I'm like, no, are you, you're, you're kidding me. Um, but it was, but I definitely wanted to get there. Like, I wanted, I wanted that moment, and I wanted, you know, wanted to see where it was going to go. Um, so I thought you did a really good job at, at keeping my interest um, through all of those episodes and kind of building and, and moving the story along. So I thought that was I thought that was really good. Um, and then yeah, I too have a I have a bunch of questions for you. So I don't know if we're allowed to jump into yeah. those if we want to go back through. I want to ask one question because t you both said that you were wanting to see more of an active Brian character, the the guy in the other cell. Is that more of a writing issue for you, or is that more of a directing issue, or an acting issue? I mean, for me, I felt like I didn't need him to physically do an action, but I felt like at some points he, like, I didn't believe that he, like, for instance, if um, if the guy came in and was like doing something to Sarah then I felt like him just sitting there um, silent for a while was odd. Or then the second he did speak up, I don't know, it just felt like it wasn't natural in some, at some points. I felt like, you know, a person would naturally, like, get up and do something. Or And I do, I agree with Rob where he's like, he doesn't want to break the set. Like, I felt like sometimes he should have come up closer to the bars or grabbed the bars. And, like, that's what I think someone would naturally do or try to get out, like, try to get to the guy um, that's out there. So I felt like he wasn't doing natural things that he normally would have do done because he was, you know, he was being nice to your set. <laughs> so I don't know the way to fix that issue besides, you know, really put him in a jail cell. Um, but there, I mean, there were other moments, and I can't think of one off the top of my head, but I don't know, Rob, if you have anything else to add. I think it's actually probably both uh, directing and acting at times. Um, because the acting being that his lines, because I don't think it's a writing issue, because you wrote the character's lines very specifically. I mean, there he's real loose. He's sometimes a little too glib. Um, but that's, I think, why he comes across as a little too glib, because he's sort of falling into Jordan's pattern. Because um, she's kind of drawing him into this kind of... It gets a, he gets a little moody. And that whole caged man, if he just, just like, loosened up. So I feel like he wasn't loose enough, and then you're probably constraining him at times because of the shots that you're setting up. Because you had such specific, I mean, shots set up for that thing. And I'm sure, and there's nothing worse than having a nice shot and then having an actor want to screw it up. <laughs> um, so I felt like there was a little bit of that. Like, there were pretty pictures instead of, uh, letting him kind of go, which could have been a choice to shoot him in a slightly different style to kind of help us feel. But I mean, I don't. 
uh, other than hindsight, I don't know what I would have done differently. I would hope I would think that of this while I was shooting it, but who knows. Alrighty, this actually segues us into the uh, next part of our program here. Uh, we're actually going to do our question and answer. We will start with Mark, who already had his first question. But first, Mark can ask the questions he wants of the panel, and then we'll move through the panel one at a time so they can ask their questions of Mr. Gardner. Uh, what's your next question, Mr. Gardner? Oh, I was hoping we'd go the other way. But, uh, <laughs> if you want to, we can go the other way. That's certainly not a problem. I would love to go the other way. I, I would love to hear more from them. Um, I, you know, I've spent a lot of time evaluating in my head doing my own personal postmortem, I really want to hear what other people say and just get some honest feedback and questions from everyone. All right, let's move into it then. Mr. Newcomb, you're up first, sir. All right. Uh, the first question I had was, how did you uh, come up with this story and decide that the web was going to be the medium of choice for it? Um. Short version. Let me think. Uh, <laughs> I actually, I was, um, I was very fortunate in that when I when I decided to take the leap and really start pursuing this, I I literally made the decision one night. I turned in my resignation the next day at the job that I had right then. So it was like I had nothing. So I was going, and I was very fortunate that not long after that, I turned in a writing sample to a local production company. Uh, they were developing a TV show that they were going to be pitching, and they, they wanted people to come on board. So I was fortunate that they picked me to do this. So me and a couple of other writers spent about a year developing a one-hour drama for TV. We had the full season done. We had our pilots written. We were ready to do our table read. And uh, the producer backed out right before we cast the table read. So I had a year of work, scripts written all over the place, and no ownership of the IP. Awesome. It was great. Um, so I got a little frustrated, and that was honestly, that was right about the time that Felicia was uh, doing a lot of work with the Guild and getting started with the Guild. So I really started following that, and I realized the more I looked at it, I was like, wait, this is something we really need to be looking at. And that's when I decided, okay, I can do this on my own. I don't need somebody else's permission. What can I do? And that brought in the idea of, okay, this is my first production. I need small scale. Small sets, few locations, few characters. One set, one location, three characters. And then it was just a matter of fleshing out that story. And actually, it changed a lot because the very first early drafts, there was no Sarah character in it at all. So it changed a lot from when I first started breaking the story. But that's, that's essentially how it showed up in the first place. So was this... Something that you, was this an idea that you already had that you sort of adapted to the web? Or was it just, you set out and go like, all right, I'm going to put something, make something for the web, and that's what happened. That's I what sat down happened. and wrote this, I wrote this specifically for the web. Which okay. leads me to a question, because I, I was told by someone, and it was a critique I had not heard before, they said that they felt like they were watching a movie that was cut up into episodes. I'm curious if you guys had that sensation as well. Did this feel like something that was made for the web, or did it feel like it was a film that was cut up? Uh, my my thoughts were that I, I think I've seen it with uh, several series, and I, you know, I think mine probably suffers from the same kind of thing. But when when you're trying to tell a story through, you know, ten or twelve episodes. If those episodes don't, can't stand on their own, it makes it really hard to, uh, you know, come in in the middle of an episode, or you know, come in the middle of the season and try to catch up, or you know, have any idea what's going on, uh, you know. And, and I guess that's the way the uh, the reason TV's structured the way it is. When you're trying to tell one story with you know lots of episodes, it it definitely feels like a movie because that's the same type of thing that a film does. It tells one story over, you know, an hour, a couple hours worth of time, and I feel that's what a lot of series do, and that you know that may or may not be the best uh, way to release stuff. But everything's you know everyone has their own opinion on that. Okay, Rob, your thoughts on Mark's uh, question? Yeah, I want to. I want to talk. Yeah, um, uh, I think the reason 
I felt both. <laughs> Again, I hate being wishy-washy, but the first mm -hmm. half of it, or not the first half, but like this episode three through six or something like that, felt like a movie cut up because uh, not a lot happens story-wise uh, that's not character story-wise. You know, I mean, not a lot's going to happen anyway. They're not. They're not leaving the room, but. Uh, I, when I watched it the first time, I often felt like I had missed an episode, or if I had missed an episode, I don't think I would have noticed. It's not until after you get past that middle hump and the story starts really rolling mm -hmm. that it feels episodic. Like, you almost have themes toward the end that aren't there. Like, each individual episode toward the end feels like it's got something to say, whereas some of those ones in the middle feel like they're continuing just to say the same thing for a little while, almost... I don't want to say it's padded out, but it feels a little padded out. Um, and so that's my answer to that. It's both. <laughs> Allison? Um, yeah, I would... I mean, I liked that... I feel like it, it could it could have... It could be one whole film, but I felt like the episodes, you kind of... we were re You were revealing different things each time, it felt like. Um, maybe not big enough things sometimes, you know, um, but I felt like each time I watched an episode, I got a little something, and it made me want to want to watch more. Um, I do let's see what was I gonna say. It I did like because as I said, this was the first time I watched it from the beginning to the end in one sitting, and I felt a similar thing that Rob said. I'd seen episodes, but not in order, and 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 so I actually didn't really know which episodes I had seen. I saw some at ITV Fest, I saw some online. I actually until I sat down and watched it all, I didn't even really. I was like, oh, I've seen episode one, episode you know six, seven, eight, and episode eleven, and you know I didn't even know, and so it's kind of a, a weird thing that you could watch some. Something that obviously has an arc, but but mix, you know mix it up. Um, so I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, but that was just something that I realized as I was watching it. That, like Rob said, in the middle, I think a lot of those episodes could have been swapped. Uh, question for the other two: How what would you how would you have rather watch this uh, as a series or in like one? Like as one uh, continuous, I guess, product. And for me, I think the answer is I would, I would have liked to sit through, uh, sat through and watched the the whole thing, end to end, and you know, in one sitting, as opposed to uh, breaking it up. I felt like I missed a little or forgot a little, you know, between, you know, the week or so when when episodes came out. But I wanted to see what uh, you two thought as well. Let's go to Rob. Uh, I thought, uh, I, you know, it's that's. <laughs> I can't. Can I be more wishy-washy? <laughs> uh, because Ladies and gentlemen, I, I, Mitt Romney. I, yeah, oh, I like watching political. <laughs> oh, oh, politics. <laughs> um, <laughs> I like watching it back to back to back. But those in those middle episodes were, like Allison said, little tiny bits of information were doled out almost always at the toward the end of the episodes. It got monotonous when I watched it back to back to back. But if I was watching it for the first time as an episodic, that would be exciting to me. Now, whether or not I could exactly remember in the whole week, <laughs> if I wasn't exactly just thinking about so all the time, that's another question. Because I, I had the same thing happen to me that Allison happened. I didn't know actually which episodes I had seen and which ones I would seen actually a couple of times. And I had missed episodes, and I thought I'd seen the whole series before, and I hadn't. Um, but I never sat down and watched it back to back. But anyway, that's my answer. Okay, Allison. Yeah. Um, for me, I think um, I liked watching it all the way through. Um, for me, I had seen episodes here and there, but I feel like it's a commitment. You know, it, it's always. Um, Cell was always one of those shows where Rob and I were like, we want to sit down and watch watch Cell, and but do we have like an hour, hour and a half, or however long the total runtime? And like, no, we don't. Well, we don't want to sit down and watch it all and not give it our all. Um, so I'd only seen like four or five episodes here and there because I never committed to watching the whole thing. I feel like if I was gonna watch it, you know, week by week, I wouldn't. 
I don't think I would go back just because I wouldn't want to watch it in, I don't know, I wouldn't want to watch it in pieces, but I think I also don't watch most TV that way anymore either. I wait until I can watch it all. And I don't know if it's this like instant gratification thing or what, but I would rather not just take, you know, 10 minutes to move on. And I do too many things during my day and my week to like have to remember those things. I'm not a very good um, watcher, I guess. <laughs> I need to devote an hour to what I'm doing and really care about it. I can't like watch something here and go do something else. So that's my answer. Let me ask you guys a quick question about those middle episodes because a couple of times you said that they felt like they were just a little too repetitive. And you're absolutely right. I tried to reveal a little bit and maybe it was too little. I'm curious if you guys picked up in those episodes. The idea was that I was going to drop little bits of character and little bits of history that would all kind of come together in the final episode. I'm wondering if you caught those little bits or if it just wasn't enough to really make that reveal work at the end. Let's go to Matt. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, I definitely caught some of the stuff. And, like, the, the thing that I liked throughout was that it it did build up this this kind of stuff where you're like, oh, we're, we're not really just, you know, in a guy's basement somewhere in a cell. There's other things going on. And I, and I did appreciate that. And... Like I, I, I do think it. You really hit your stride towards the end of the, the season. Like th those, were, like my favorite episodes to watch was that that last build up. I think it's one of the strongest uh, I've seen. But I do think that, you know what, you know when when there's such a, lag time between the episodes, and, the content. You know, I mean, you're you're like five minutes, five to you know seven minutes a week. You know, there's a lot of time to. I guess miss some of those more subtle things uh, that you you can pick up again on a repeat viewing, but but yeah, I mean the the first time through when I missed a few here and there, I, I would say that I kind of agree that it felt like it just uh, it 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 moved too slowly uh, in that part. Rob, yeah, I think it. I missed. I. I know I missed it the first part. I mean, the first time I watched it, and I guess it's good that I didn't need it, but I, I missed, like, what they did for a living and all that stuff the first time I watched the show. I must have just missed those episodes. But I got very excited when he was from Culver City. Um, <laughs> uh, but I missed all of that stuff, which was cool. And, you know, the funny thing is the first time I watched it, I even missed the song. And and I don't know how I missed the song because I think that's the most clever part of that whole. I really like that, um, mm -hmm. and and I don't know if you got if you got permission to use it <laughs> or not. Fair but, use, yeah. my friend. Fair use. <laughs> okay, good. But I, I don't care if you did or didn't. Sting is rich enough. <laughs> uh, um, but I really like that, and I'm sorry that I missed it the first time. Uh, and I don't know how I missed it. You know, it's one of those things. They they hardly talk. There's a lot of Moments landing. There's a lot of space between lines. There are. There thinking are. about what they're going to say next. And if you're not paying attention, they'll say it while you're checking Twitter. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Mm -hmm. Which Allison? is another thing oh. about... Oh, I was just going to say, like, another thing about watching stuff online is that you're vying for people's attention. When they're in front of the TV, you, you mostly have their attention. But, uh, yeah, I found that, too. Sometimes I'd be checking my email while watching and then like hear a, a whispered line and have to go back and <laughs> catch it again. The lesson so is maybe, that maybe TV the, has maybe no the whispers. <laughs> yeah. That TV new has. No, the whispers that and Mark's like, yeah, I did that. I made sure that the sound was a little hard to hear so that you were paying attention. <laughs> you had to pay attention. Right. <laughs> okay, what are your thoughts, Allie? Um, well, I, I mean, I agree. I think that it's easy to miss the subtle things. I think while I was watching it this time, I was obviously paying, trying to pay a lot more attention to every detail. Um, but it is, I think, like, for me, in the beginning, in the first, like, couple episodes, you're trying to figure out, like, what's going on and what is this about? And so it's interesting in itself because the, the concept is interesting. 
um, in the middle, because we know we're stuck there, um, you know, I think the pacing, if the pacing was a little tighter, I feel like it would be easier to stay with it um, and, and to get those, those hints and those clues that are happening. And then, you know, towards the end, that's when it ramps up. And so maybe um, because of the story, it didn't need that. But those middle episodes, I think that it's, I don't know, for me, it would be the timing that needs, needed to be tweaked so that we stay interested while, like, now that we're settling into what's going on, What's important is the information, so let's not lose our, our lose our attention. All right, Mr. Newcomb, you have any more questions for Mr. Gardner? Uh, I'm sure I do, but I'll uh, I'll let some of the other people go down their list first. All right, no problem. Let's go to Mr. Rob Paget now with your questions for Mark. Um, okay, I'm, I'm trying to find one. Oh, I have one, but first I, I wanted to say, you know, as far as the details from the middle coming back towards the end. I and I don't want to I don't want to spoil anything for anything, but I love how her her uh, expertise uh, came back in the end to make a very horrible thing seem really kind of cool and very surgical. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, what were the okay? Here's my question. This is a stupid question. What were they eating? <laughs> <laughs> what, was that nasty, what was that nasty stuff that he could put into the cell on its side? Yeah. <laughs> that was um, Whole Foods organic apple cinnamon oatmeal mixed up with a lot of plain bagels. Oh, my God. <laughs> and it, a lot of those times when Jordan was like, Looking like she was, she was looking like because she was about to throw up. It was nasty stuff. It was, <laughs> did you just use that same stuff for her vomit in the show? <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it only makes sense, right? Yes. Sure. It, it's got to come out looking about what it did when it went in. Cause <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. Uh, oh God, you know I don't. Oh, oh! I have one. I don't want to take a good question from Allison. So go ahead, go ahead, Allison. <laughs> All right, let's go over to Allison now. By default, Rob has resigned. <laughs> uh, he's resigned. Um, well, Mark, I have a few questions that are more are less about the actual story and shooting, but more about the bigger picture. Um, what did you do in terms of? Well, okay, did you release? You shot everything at once, and then did you release weekly? Uh, that was the original plan. We released weekly. We we had actually had not finished cutting when we started release. We thought that we had enough of a cushion so that we could maintain that, but we actually had to stop at one point and catch up. So it took yeah. us a little bit of catching up in the middle. And then when I found out that we were going to reshoot the finale, we took another hiatus. Gotcha. So it was, How long were those hiatuses? Hiatus, hiatus, <laughs> something like that. Um, the first one was about two weeks, I think, and then the second one, I think that we were actually gone for almost a month. We were almost gone for a solid month. Okay. Um, I think that's about right. Yeah, if I remember, it's been so long. That's nothing. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I was going to yeah. say, like, a two-week hiatus? Ooh. No. Well, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 Considering that we did shoot everything all at once, though, right. we had all the footage. What we didn't have was right. sound, and we had to do a lot of work on sound, and we did have to go back and do ADR, which may have been one of the reasons why the sound seemed a little too clean at times. Like you were saying earlier, it may have just been because we were sitting in a closet. But you did a good job of, your sound person did a good job of matching the ADR to the room, because I couldn't really tell, and, and I'm, I can usually tell. I could tell a couple places, but most of it was real nice. I would just put the reverb back into all of it. Gotcha. Then, then you're mess. you know, it's a whole... It's a mess. Our it's sound a was... Other, <laughs> a lot of work. And we actually, when I got my sound files, um, we were actually, there were 100 sound files that were empty. So there were 100 shots that had no sound that I either couldn't use or I was going to be forced to go back into ADR. So sound was a nightmare on this. Yeah. Sucks. Just a nightmare. That sucks. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so a question following up with that one about um, what, how you released. So what was your plan? Like, did you market it um, before you released it? Um, like, did you do any sort of 
um, audience building beforehand, or did you just kind of throw it up and? Oh, I was extremely it. naive. I was extremely naive. I followed the space, but in reality, I was extremely naive at what needed to happen before this. I was fortunate that Coldcast um, found us early and said, "Yeah, we want to. We want to have you on our site." That was huge for us. If it wasn't for Coldcast and their marketing efforts, nobody would have ever heard of us because I was hugely naive. I had built the website, I had done all of this stuff, but I did not really understand what it took to build an audience. And that's that was my own fault. And that's the biggest thing I learned from this. The landscape has changed in the two years since I released this show to the nth degree. And that is one thing I would do completely different. That's why the website for my next project is already up. And I don't even have money for this thing yet. <laughs> so um, that Unfortunately, I did not do enough of that. I was marketing after we started releasing, really. I got a little buzz early on so that we could try to get things. Um, and it was relatively successful for what it did. Looking back, I would have done about 100 times more than that, and I think that we would have seen even more success than we got out of the deal. Gotcha. Yeah, and, you know, and that was kind of because I wasn't paying attention or you know, when you released, I didn't know it was being released. I, I didn't see it until, um, you know, ITV Fest, I guess, a year and a half ago. Um, and so, you know, I wasn't kind of like in the loop when that was happening. I didn't know what you had had done. Um, did you, I guess, I mean, I guess with your, your upcoming show, I mean, you have, because of Cell, you have that knowledge and you also have a lot of other people paying attention to what you're doing. So, um, I don't know, I guess, I mean, we all learn from from what we've done in the past. Um, but I also feel like, you know, coming out of Texas, I feel like you probably get a lot more support, at least in the press. And I don't know, maybe I'm maybe I'm being naive about it. <laughs> you don't think so? Nothing? Really? <laughs> no. No. I, I, I'm going to say the opposite on that. I mean, even I have trouble even getting local newspapers to cover anything. They they don't see it as the same. If I were in L.A. making something, I think I would probably have a better chance of getting local Austin gotcha. stuff to cover. Oh, than yeah, doing. you might be able to get Austin, but you wouldn't be able to get local Los Angeles. No, you're right. That's true. Right. But, yeah, I, I have sent out multiple press releases to blogs, newspapers, you name it. I've sent a ton of it out there. And while there has been some off of that, there's been some great articles out there, it has been pulling teeth. So I would not I would not say that I've gotten any press support because I'm from Texas. I wish that were the case. <laughs> but no. Who I wrote you agree. up before you went out online? You got a write up in some some place before you went yeah, online. Yeah. Tube Filter did a quick write up. They I sent them something and they saw a um, it was a preview trailer that I put out that was Actually, it wasn't even the preview trailer. I sent them dailies. Did you? Um, I did. I sent them some dailies and said, look, I would love to get some coverage. And they saw that. And I think at that point, I had shot a 30-second teaser that I had just put up. And they saw that. And that's what they wrote their article based off of, was off of that teaser, uh, some of the production stills, and just some quick dailies that I had sent them. So that's, I mean, it doesn't feel like that's where I read about it, but it, it must have been, I mean, if that was it, yeah, because I saw your teaser trailer, and then I didn't even know you had launched until, like, you were in episode three. I was like, <laughs> oh, that, I think that's that same show that I saw, like, months ago. Yeah, that's <laughs> me failing. Oh. <laughs> oh. Yeah. I've learned a lot since then, I can tell you that I, much. Well, it was, we all have, I mean... Oh, yeah. <laughs> It's, yeah, that, yeah. You don't want to hear my early strat lack of strategies. At least you had, knew what you were not doing. I didn't even know. And yeah. we all sucked at it. <laughs> yes, the uh, the classic viral internet fantasy. Everything we do will go viral. It just will. Yes, yeah. it'll oh. be so clever. How will they not notice? Yes. Oh, there we go. Um, Mark, I have another question for you. Um, so. Obviously, with the finale the way it is, I would assume a second season, if it were to happen, would be drastically different than the first. Yes. Is that, I mean, and was that your idea all, the, all along? And um, if so, you know, well, 
my my question is, you know, are you going to make a season two? Um, and if you if you were going to, how would you retain, I guess, the audience that you have built in season one if it's going to be so drastically different and kind of like, you know, keeping the same show? It's like, you know, your brand that you created, it, it would be very different, it seems. Right. That's, that's one of the perpetual struggles. Um, first question. I would love to make season two of this. Love to make season two of this. Um, I do have, you know, Matt mentioned before that I built a huge world. Um, one of the reasons that Beth Chamberlain came on board was because I sent her the Bible, and she was like, what? Oh, my God. I mean, there's a lot of story here that I would love, love, love to tell. Having said that, you're absolutely right. The show changes drastically. Um, from the finale, you can probably tell that one of the biggest changes is that there are a lot more characters mm -hmm. and there's a lot more locations. There is no way I could do season two sitting in a cell. That's just, <laughs> it's just not going to work. So you could. I could. Back uh, in the cell. Yeah, I saw things happening that could have just gone right back to that cell. Just go right back. I could go back to that cell. I would get bored with that. <laughs> um, so, the reality is, is that for me to go on with this, I've got three times as many characters. I've got exterior locations, multiple interior locations, plus rebuilding the original set because it's been completely torn apart at this point. We had to vacate the place, so it's been completely destroyed, and all the props and everything are gone away. Um, and pay people. Um, pay. <laughs> uh, all of this basically <laughs> says it's a lot of money. And I have not found that cash register for this project yet. If I can find that cash register, I will make season two. Um, I just have not found that cash register yet. I would love to be able to say, yes, I know where I'm going to make the money back on this for season two. I don't know that yet. And that drives me crazy because they have some virulent fans who want to see what happens. Um, and I don't want to disappoint them. And I think if I don't do it the way I feel it needs to be done, I feel it will be a disappointment. Well, and you, you've got a slight... I mean, the project itself, that you're at a disadvantage because it's very, very lost feeling yeah. to me. The way that you've structured the storytelling is so very... It reminds me of Lost, especially at the end. Um, Sorry. And there, they had you know tons of money. They could go wherever they felt like going at any given moment and build their world as needed. And you can't, you I mean, unless you find a ton of cash, you can't do that. <laughs> uh, so I mean, I hope you find it because it's it's cool. I want to see where it's going, but uh, it's tough. You you almost wrote yourself into a corner. <laughs> oh, I did. Let's not lie. I wrote myself <laughs> in a corner. He wrote himself into just... a cell. I did. <laughs> 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 oh, oh, well, let me let me take that question. I want to turn it back on you guys. Um, has that ship sailed? Is season two too far removed from season one? Nothing dies on the internet. I'm learning that now more than ever. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the the best things about being on the internet is that you're just because you've launched cell it doesn't mean new people aren't still finding it every day and you know you you've, we've seen the resurgence uh of other shows right uh you know rest of development's coming back uh you know it happened with other shows there's no reason that uh you still can't find new people to watch your show cuz in the grand scheme of the all the people on the internet uh not a whole lot of people have still watched, uh, you know, Cell or or anything really for that matter. So there's still still a lot uh, that I think there's still a lot of potential to to do more of that. I think, for sure. Yeah, I I would be I would definitely be interested in seeing more. And I think you have the you definitely are in a good position. I think you know most people when they're starting out. I think like you know, think too big, and I think you picked the right 
the right size season one to make season one. You learned a lot from it. You got good actors. You have good story. And and to move into a season two and expand drastically like like you've set yourself up to would be a really good exercise, I think. You know, you, you've gone through season one, you know, in this small, um, controlled environment. Let's see what you can do. I think if you could pull off doing a season two as you've set it up, I think it would be a big win and you, you know, it could do a lot for you as a creator. Um, and you, and you have so, and the, like the, the cool thing is like, yes, we all, we all are doing new projects and moving on and doing all these other things, but why not start further than, you know, at zero? You're, you know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna invest time and money into something, you've already, you already have, you know, X amount of viewers who have watched. You have the, you have something created, like we were talking about, like the brand, you've got, you know, you branded yourself and you created this brand, um, use it, you know, move forward. If you still want, if you still like it, do it or the possibility of doing it, um, you're, you're starting ahead of where, where you would with a new project. Um, and it's a good, and it's a good story. And I, I don't think that it's something that you, you know, say like, oh no, you know, you, you learn from it, move on. I just, I think that there's potential there. So I would, I would continue with it if you could. Well, I think that the, right now the momentum is gone. So you could do whatever you want now. I mean, you could do it or don't do it. I mean, the nice thing is, is like, just like Allison said, you're not starting from scratch. Um, and the way you structured it, if you decided to go to a season two uh, or something completely bigger and different, this season one doesn't even necessarily need to be a season one. It feels almost like a prologue. You know, it's backstory of, of your main character, and then you could treat it as a prologue, and boom. You know, you've got the promotional material. We're going to do Cell Season 2. You don't know what that is? Here's Season 1. You know, so it, it's it's easier to do that with something like Cell than it is for, like, Life from the Inside. If Life from the Inside were to come back uh, in some <laughs> form, maybe, somewhere, um, we can't use it as a prologue. We're basically redoing the show. But you can use this as a prologue, even if the style is different, even if the, you know, all the mood is different. You could completely change your show now, and you still have this prologue that fits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, Allison, did you have any other questions before we move into our follow-ups here? Uh, no, that was, that was most of them. Okay. Uh, Mark, uh, excuse me, Matt or Rob, are there questions that you didn't get a chance to ask that you'd like to uh, has any, we could we could ask the the Tim Street question. <laughs> Go oh, for one? it. Uh, well, what was uh, who's your uh, intended audience when you when you sat down and came up with this? Oh God, my that's such a great question. Who's my intended audience with this? Um, when I wrote it, my audience was Lost fans. <laughs> Done. That's which. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> I, I guess that worked. Um, I I never specifically said that I want this to be you know women eighteen to thirty five or men twenty four to eighty eight whatever. Um, I never sat down with that kind of specific demographic. I thought of the genre that I liked. I thought of shows that I admired, and I thought this is what I like to watch. I want to create a show like this, and I want fans like me to watch this show. Um, is that specific enough to really go to somebody to sponsor and say, this is my demographic? No, it's really not, and I admit that. Um, is it something I probably need to evaluate for going on to a season two? You tell me. Um, is it enough to say, this is who I want to watch this show, this is who I wrote it for, or do I need to be able to say, I think 18 to 24 female is going to love this. No, I think you've got enough information that you don't have to go into standard demographics. I mean, you know who likes the show, all the soap opera. This a lot of women like your show. They do. A lot of women who I was like soap opera. Yeah, it's it's kind of weird what people like, isn't it? You can never tell. Yeah, but women no. like your show, and uh, and I see why. I mean, I, I it seems to fit when you think of it retroactively like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's enough information you have. You know, all the soap opera write-ups and all that kind of great crazy stuff you got. I think they would be happy with that. Yeah, and, you know, I guess you're saying this was your first project, so you, you know, I find that you know maybe you guys can agree or disagree, but 
you know, when you're doing a project that's for you, then you concentrate more on something that you would want to see get made as opposed to, you know, picking a certain demographic out there. Well, I think it's the best way to go, too. You can second-guess your demographics all day long. Sure. But and they'll change once you're released. Yeah, be, exactly. Yeah, as you, as you may have found out, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't expect that breakdown. <laughs> uh, I have a question. Um, if Matt's done. Matt, are you done? Sure. Um, uh, first of all, I, I keep forgetting this is your first thing. Like, your first first thing, right? My first first thing, yeah. Yeah, it's it's pretty freaking solid for the first first yeah. thing. Yeah, oh, thanks. <laughs> um, my first first thing is definitely not as good as Cell. <laughs> um, so, uh, no, it's, yeah, it's not as good as Cell. Uh, what, uh, how did putting Beth Chamberlain in the show uh, change the, uh, the attention that you got? Um, I think it changed the attention in that we got more of the demographic that already loved us, <laughs> if that means anything to you. We, we had a lot of soap opera fans and women that loved the show, and getting Beth involved opened that up even wider. So the people that didn't even know we exist, but they were still fans of that kind of content who were familiar with Beth all of a sudden said, whoa, wait, there's this other show? This is awesome. I'm going to watch this episode with Beth. And I got a lot of messages. I watched that episode. I got to go back and watch the whole thing now. So, I mean, it really did help because Beth automatically tied into the demographic that was really responding to the content, or one of the demographics. There were many, but that one specific segment, she really drew in even more people than I expected. I mean, she was, she was great, and she is amazing to work with. Work with her if you can. Awesome. And, and she's perfect casting. I mean, when you perfect. think about the demo, like she could totally make that thing go into a television show. Absolutely. And I will say that I rewrote the part for her. Um, but, yeah. That when she said she was interested, I was like, "Yes, let me write." <laughs> and yeah, I, I beefed up that character more, and I actually changed the Bible specifically because she was in here because. If I can make season two happen, I want her back, and I want her, and she will have a significant part to play in season two. She'd be good too. Yeah, she's mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah. All right. Any other questions from anybody? No. All right. Good blood. Anything uh, oh. from you, Mark? Oh. I have a slight criticism of the finale. <laughs> Please. As long as it doesn't spoil things, of course. It doesn't. There's a lot of walking. <laughs> yes, there there is a lot of walking, and I will say, I when I watched the season finale, there's a point in the middle of where I'm like, get to it already, my <laughs> God! So I completely agree with that. Um, if I were to recut it, I would cut a little more. Actually, if I were to reshoot it, I would have directed a little differently for this middle section where it does drag a little bit on the walkie. I agree completely. You, you know, you know what's funny is that I think that that's actually could be used as a metaphor for the middle of the show. Oh um, yeah. Because we yeah. know something's <laughs> coming. We know by the middle of the show something's coming, and we just want to get there. And you just keep holding it back and holding it back. It's like Jordan walking through the, you know, the, all the walking. It's like just get someplace. Go! We know you're going to get someplace, and it's going to be exciting, and it's going to be cool. Just freaking get there already. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. I got you. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Thank you for that. Sure. <laughs> All but right. But, ladies and gentlemen, this will bring to an end our post-mortem on Cell, the web series. I'd like to thank our presenter this evening, Mr. Mark Gardner. Woo hey, thank you. Thank you for putting this together, and thanks, everybody, for all the feedback and everything. Thank you so much. I also would like to thank this evening our uh, evaluating panel, which was Mr. Matt Newcomb, Yay! Mr. Rob Paget, and Ms. Allison <laughs> Van Orr. Yay! Yes, luckily tonight there were no whammies whatsoever. I'd like to thank everybody. Uh, again, my name is James Fernandez of Tightrope. Uh, the postmortems are not don't have any specific schedule, but as we get them done, I will put them through the magic of editing, and we'll put them up so that way we can have a little inside baseball, and hopefully everyone can learn a little something from everyone else because that's what these are all about. Thank you yeah. very much for coming out tonight. Uh, I will see you soon on a tightrope channel near you. 
And for now, Hello. this is James Fernandez saying have a good evening. Thank you very much. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.